across the fence, we're going to learn about the weird and wild side of Vermont history as I talk with the author of the new book, Wicked Vermont. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Our guest today is a native Vermonter who's written several books, including Ghosts and Legends of Lake Champlain and Haunted Inns and Ghostly Getaways of Vermont. She is also the creator of Queen City Ghost Walk, which has helped earn her the nickname the Queen of Halloween. Thea Lewis is with us to share some insights and stories from her new book, Wicked Vermont. Always great to see you. It's great to be here. Boy, there are no shortage of characters. Oh, gosh. No, no. It just the list goes on and on. So in a nutshell, what is in this new book? This new book is kind of a fun mix of some crazy, scandalous tales, from, uh, things that happened in Vermont back in the 1700s, 1800s. Uh, we actually go into the early 1900s. Uh, it's prohibition, prostitution, love triangles, uh, a young boy who ran away with the circus, a Burlington kid who made good by becoming a, a character called the Devil Rider. <laughs> so how do you find out about these people? How do you research them? Well, I'm a mad Googler. I do a lot of Googling and I do uh, subscribe to some different services that let me fall down the rabbit hole of history, uh, old newspapers, and, uh, and, and sometimes it's just a, a never, never ending sort of quest because I get one story and that leapfrogs into the next and the next and the next and before you know it, um, I, I may have two books that I need to be filling, but this one was a lot of fun. Okay, let's get into some of the, the details now. Sure. True detective stories, tell me about that. Well, True Detective Stories uh, is about the case of Lucina Corser Broadwell, a woman who lived in Barrie. Uh, she was uh, a young mother of two. Uh, her husband was, uh, was a, an interesting character in that he was kind of going out on the sly. He had women friends, but what people didn't realize until this case evolved was that Lucina was also um, what they called back in the day kind of sporty. Yeah. I love that, the term. <laughs> She was kind of sporty, and in those days, in the in the late that 18 had a whole different meaning. <laughs> That's right. It didn't mean that you were adept at soccer or something like that. Um, back in the in Lucina's time, uh, you could go to these places that that weren't necessarily brothels, but uh, if a gentleman saw a woman who was attractive, or vice versa, and they were both willing, they could go to uh, a house in town and obtain a room and have their liaison there, mm -hmm. and. So so this story is about how Lucina was engaged in, in that, uh, but then what happened? She met with foul play. Yeah. Yeah, she was actually murdered, and that's where the story starts, is backtracking yes. to find out what was going on. That's right. And as I uh, recount in the book, a poor young gentleman finds her lying on a lawn, and uh, and her clothing is strewn about in such a way that it, it looks uh, like some kind of uh, off-kilter uh, game of hopscotch or, or a Hansel and Gretel kind of thing. She's got one article of clothing that's a certain number of paces from the body, and another, and another, uh, as though the perpetrator was just tossing all of her personal effects madly as he went. And as the detective starts investigating, these wild stories start developing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they talk to lots of different people. Uh, the detectives in town, of course, play a role. There are people who are close to Lucina, a woman mm -hmm. she's been corresponding with. Um, she's She's been writing letters. The woman knows about this sort of um, backdoor relationship that she's yeah, got going Isabel on. Isabel Parker's Party House is yes. what it was called. Isabel Parker's Party House is the place where people would meet. And, uh, and so she she meets this gentleman that she finds attractive, and at first, uh, you know, he's blaming it on on all kinds of people. He says, "Well, you know, there was a, there was an Italian guy at the house, and these other people." Uh, but um, I won't tell what what the final clue is that mm -hmm. this detective from Boston uh, he, he he comes to Burlington. He's called by the the local PD, and he finds a couple of different things that absolutely tie the murder to this one particular character. All right, let's talk about the Devil Rider because this is a great story. How American is this? Oh yeah, this is great. Um, the circus, you know, we've, we've seen that, uh, you know, circuses, smaller circuses still thrive, but these shows like Barnum and Bailey mm -hmm. uh, have been dying out for years. Uh, circus life back in the early 1800s uh, was, was perilous. I mean, I talk in the book about one circus crew who is traveling um, by, by ship and their animals are actually, with each, with each wake that comes over the ship, 
ship uh, being tossed overboard. I imagine, you know, it's like a like a crazy sort of Noah's Ark type of scenario. Right. Um, the Devil Rider, uh, Eaton Stone, was a boy who grew up in Burlington, and when he got to be, you know, uh, around 10 years old, uh, he meets some circus folk who come to town. Circuses back then uh, were great entertainment, but people found them to be a little bit unsavory because you never knew who the people were who were running the right. circuses or performing. He meets a ventriloquist, and the ventriloquist befriends him, and soon he's visiting the circus every day. And when the circus leaves, young Eaton Stone takes off with it. Uh, he learns bareback tricks and ends up going out west until finally, um, some might say that this is an appropriation of, of the native culture, but he swears that these uh, native women who are out in Arizona mm -hmm. uh, have made these costumes for him and he crafts this image of himself as the devil rider, riding bareback, riding backward, doing flips on a horse. He eventually became possibly the most famous bareback rider in the world. Amazing. Okay, Born Over the Border, Chester Allen Arthur. This is a great story. I love, I developed a new sort of affection for Chester Arthur and his giant uh, mutton chop sideburns when I, uh, when I started delving into his life. So some people think that a completely different president, a more recent one, Barack mm -hmm. Obama, was the only subject of a birther movement here in the United States. Right. But it's not true. Um, Chester Arthur, who was said to have been born in Franklin County, may actually have been born across the border at his grandparents home um, his mother was accustomed to traveling from Vermont across the border and what could be more natural than a young woman who knows that in a short time she's going to give birth she uh, her husband traveled quite a bit he was a minister and so she wanted to be with her parents she wanted to be with her parents she wanted to know that she and her unborn child and the children that she already had would be protected during this very vulnerable time so uh, it's never been proven but um, people will discover there's, a, there's an interesting thing that Chester Arthur did late in his presidency that makes me feel like, yeah, there was maybe more <laughs> to his story than meets the eye. Well, speaking of more than meets the eye, the legend of Ethan Allen, <laughs> which is really funny because we see statues of him, but we find out some interesting aspects of his character. Yeah, Ethan Allen was, I'm sure, uh, well, you know, I've, I've recently heard this expression that says, um, oh, it's something like, um, you know, uh, being fearless is one thing. Anybody can be fearless. It's not necessarily the smartest thing. But to uh, have courage, even when you know that there's something bad that's going to happen, well, that's, you know, that's the test of a real sort of hero. I'm not sure, even though we place literally Ethan Allen on a pedestal, mm -hmm. whether Ethan Allen was really a, as brave as we think or just really an awfully impulsive guy. Um, he, he certainly was larger than life uh, physically. He, uh, we, we don't really know because we don't have any photos of Ethan Allen, whether he really was movie star handsome, the way his statues depict. Um, but, uh, but we do know from people's writings that that some people found him to be more than a pill. Uh, he he was uh, he was it a hard. Depends on who you were asking. <laughs> depends on who you were asking. He was a hard drinker. He was kind of a, a braggart and a and a loudmouth. So I think one quote in the book says a drunken windbag. <laughs> a drunken windbag. So so the jury I think is still out on whether or not he should be the shining example of, of Vermont. But but you know we'll we'll take it we'll take it. Warts and all. Well warts and all. The Hermit of Champlain. Um, what I like about your book, which is which is really wonderful, are the pictures because a lot of the pictures are buildings that we still see today. Right, right. So explain this one. Well. Uh, the Hermit of Champlain. There we go. There's yeah. the photo. The Hermit of Champlain lived in the mid 1800s in the building that we know in Burlington as the Shanty on the Shore. It's a it's a fish house where they sell mm -hmm. wonderful uh, you know wonderful uh, fish dinners. Um, and this was a guy who had a business in the middle of Burlington and moved it to the waterfront. Uh, reclusive. He was called the Hermit of Champlain because he didn't mix and mingle the way other people of his generation did. Uh, you know the town and town and was not important to him. Mm -hmm. um, he had a funny habit, a uh, funny hobby. He liked to follow funerals, whether he knew the deceased or not. And he was the subject of a kind of unsavory business deal that involved another uh, mover and shaker in town, a man named Timothy Follett. And Timothy Follett's house sits overlooking Lake Champlain, this beautiful white mansion. You can't miss it. it you can't miss it. Nearly destroyed uh, during the time of urban renewal. As a matter of fact, there it is in its uh, there it is in its older incarnation before uh, the Pomerleau family 
finally restored it to its current glory. But uh, Timothy Follett was the guy who would be the first president of the Rutland and Burlington Railroad Company, and he wanted Isaac Nye's land that behind the shanty on the shore. It was actually it was actually water at that time, but he mm -hmm. needed to fill that land for the railroad, and some some harsh business dealings occurred uh, after that. So what are you working on next? Well, coming up, I'm going to be writing, I think, uh, we, haven't, we haven't settled all of the particulars yet, but I'm looking at a book on uh, Lakeview Cemetery in Burlington, which is a wonderful old lawn park cemetery, and most of it is there uh, because of the, the kindness and philanthropy of two folks who lived in Burlington in the 1800s, John Purple Howard and his sister Louisa. And so uh, John Howard donated a uh, a certain parcel of land and then after the cemetery was open and people were accustomed to going to the cemetery uh, you know on Sundays after church and picnicking with their friends mm -hmm. because that was the intent for it to be not just a place of interment but a place of, of relaxation um, Louisa Howard said wait we've got no place for people to worship when their folks are being buried so she donated the money it must have been thirty thousand dollars I think at the time for the beautiful gothic Louisa Howard Chapel that sits just inside the cemetery grounds. That's wonderful. So many Vermonters uh, know that you uh, are you're famous for your Queen City Ghost Walking Tours. How do people find out more about the tours and then where they can get your books? Well, they can go online to queencityghostwalk.com. That's our website. They can always call what I call our ghost line, which is 351-1313. <laughs> and we do sell our tickets through the Flynn Center in Burlington. Uh, the most economical way to buy tickets uh, if you live locally is to just walk up to the box office. You don't get any additional fees that way, mm -hmm. uh, but you can buy them online. Uh, you can uh, you can call 86 Flynn with the 802 area code and buy your tickets by phone. And we will, if we've got space, accept you as a walk-up. Well, terrific, and also to look for your books in bookstores. That's right. All right, Thea, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. That's our program for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.